If you think it will soon be business as usual after the world financial meltdown cools, better think again. In the words of French President Nicolas Sarkozy, les les affaires c'est fini. That's our topic and our show is Hearts and Minds. In March of 1979, I was the first network television producer to arrive just outside the nuclear power plant at Three Mile Island. I was a young producer, wasn't quite sure what was going on, didn't know how a nuclear power plant worked. Uh, but we knew that an event had occurred. That's what they were saying, and people were being evacuated. Fortunately, a colleague of mine was something of an expert. He was a producer for science pieces. And he was on the telephone with a source in Washington, and I saw the blood just drain out of his face as he put the phone down. And I said, what's up, John? And he said, it's out of control, and they can't shut it down. Parag, was there a moment this year in 2008, whether it was Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers or whatever, that you picked up the paper or turned on the television or got off the phone with a friend of yours and you said, my God, it's out of control and they can't shut it down? I'd have to say it was a string of moments. Every day we were picking up the newspaper and my wife and I were saying to each other, my God, the world is coming to an end in a way. But if you read Charles Morris's book, The Trillion Dollar Meltdown, he almost actually gives you a totally different story. It's deja vu, points to long-term capital management, other failures, and he says, look, this is cyclical. In fact, we just have such short-term memories. We forget that we, every 10 years, 15 years, go through these major crises. But this big, this big, Jeffrey? I mean. Well, there was a moment. It was the morning of September 15th. That was the day when the morning uh, radio news, the, tel uh, the newspapers, carried the story of Lehman Brothers being pushed off the edge uh, and Merrill Lynch being sold for a song. Uh, and one had this knot in his stomach, I did at least, at the sense that a black hole had opened up and was now inexorably sucking into it one after another pillar of the American economy and that there was no way to stop it. Possibly there was no way to stop it. And we've had since this serial bailouts, one after another, uh, designed to try to stave off and undoubtedly helping somewhat. It's been a major change from the 1929 to 33 period because even the but conservatives, the dedicated advocates of the laissez-faire that you say Nicolas Sarkozy has consigned to the dustbin of history, at least now, other than the Republicans in the Congress, uh, recognize that you can't sit by and have government do absolutely nothing and let the free marketeers have their just desserts. Uh, you have to step in. That's a change. I, and maybe we'll, we'll <laughs> mitigate somewhat the outcomes. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about the the solutions that have been implemented and some still being floated. But, Gary, what, I, what I'm getting at is what went on inside your, inside your mind as this, these concat this concatenation of events was unfolding this year? Well, if you recall, uh, only a few years back when the Cold War ended, we had Fukuyama as the end of history, the idea that the whole Francis world Fukuyama. had to, Francis Fukuyama, had to uh, parallel the United States in terms of its economic policy and that somehow a laissez-faire free market system was ideal and less government was better government. Now we're faced with a situation where the only entity that can fix this situation is government intervention. And so, ironically, we're going in the opposite direction from where we came. And uh, even you have Bush, who was definitely the leader in this movement, who uh, has been the most interventionist when it comes to economic policies and, and the role of government. So it, it's turned itself on its head in, in one way or another. The, uh, uh, most uh, people agree that the Bush foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, was a disaster. Okay. But when the world, when the United States, uh, when the world looks at the United States, people were saying, you know, we have to improve our image because of Guantanamo, because of Abu Ghraib, because of all of these things. But is this financial failure, which most people are laying at our doorstep saying you guys started it with this toxic stuff that got it, is this more, does this shake people more? throughout the rest of the world uh, uh, concerning the United States image than our foreign policy. In other words, is this, is this saying, oh my God, we could trust 
If there was nothing else we could trust about America, it was their financial system. What do you think, Prague? I would say it's a mix of all of these things. You know, the, the, the role of public diplomacy is often been viewed as just a popularity contest, but in fact, the aggregate image that people have of America has always had something to do with uh, the, the, the belief that America's economic model, laissez faire, winner take all, has been very negative. Europeans have always, part of a, a pillar of anti Americanism in Europe has been the critique of that social model. So there's always been an economic component, not just the foreign policy, you know, sort of being out of sync with what the rest of the world. World, quote unquote wants. So I think that these things really are cumulative. But this well, for the go past ahead. quarter century, Parag, uh, while yes, many Europeans, particularly of the left, pushed back at it, what it always had going for it was the at least illusion that it was successful. That you Europeans have one percent annual growth rates and we by unleashing the magic of the marketplace mm -hmm. are able to do three percent, four percent. So what had disguised for decades uh, the, the fundamental rot at the base of the economic, um, economic system, its apparent success at generating benefits, although in the aggregate they might look fine in terms of their distribution, uh, less they fair created an ever more skewed one. When that disappears, then there is nothing left. The emperor has no clothes. And the Bush people had had the sense that you really didn't need to worry about economics because they would take care of themselves. We'll do military, we'll do foreign policy, and the international law be damned. And now it has all caved in, one after another, and the Amer Americans are standing in the rubble of what is arguably the most disastrous administration in its history. And, and Gary and, and Alan Greenspan was an, an enabler to, to a great extent, was he well, not? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this was uh, American economic policy, and, and we were trying to extend it around the globe. And if you look at, uh, for example, the World Bank, IMF, uh, major lending institutions, dominated example, by Americans by this and idea. Europeans, we'll, we'll give you money if you change your economic system to resemble the American economics. And not only that, you have to buy in our values. I mean, you've got to agree that the, that the values that go along with this economic system are the only values that will lead to development and, and growth and so forth. Uh, Samuel Huntington was making this kind of argument. Uh, you perhaps have, uh, another scholar, Lawrence Harrison, uh, wrote Culture Matters, and his whole argument was you shouldn't even help another government to get on its feet unless it adopts this economic system and these cultural values. So it had an overlay of cultural imperialism is too strong a word, but certainly cultural determinism that unless you adopt the values, you're simply not going to have a civic society and you're not going to grow economically, and now those are coming into question. Right. Let's just be clear, I completely agree, but I want to emphasize that Americans are always the last to understand their own failures. So the things that we're saying, in fact, are, you know, we are saying conventional yes. wisdom now post Lehman Brothers. As far as I'm concerned, I wrote a book in 2006 oh, yeah. that did not predict a financial collapse, but said, look at state capitalism, sovereign wealth funds, and the ways in which financial flows and trade regimes... Because they were all... They were all this was all moving beyond IMF and World Bank already five, six, seven years ago after the Asian financial crisis. And Paul everyone Truman else was already predicted. well prepared to move into um, a world in which they were not reliant on the United States. It's the U.S. that was, as Paul Krugman says, you know, running off the cliff and then waiting its legs sort of, you know, flurrying before it fell. So this was, you know, I, I didn't predict a financial collapse, but I said, look, China has the state capitalist model as using sovereign wealth funds, building foreign exchange reserves, diversifying them. Europe, same thing, state capitalism, protectionism. Mm -hmm. The U.S. model has been the outlier for a very long time. It needed to snap into line at some point. Right. Well, let's face it, Parag, a country that maintains the enormous security establishment that it does cannot long continue to do so if its economic base is eroded. And in fact, if we're now going to need to borrow $700 billion, a oh, trillion dollars a more than that, in order yeah. to pump money in uh, at a point where we've already exhausted our normal borrowing capacity by the gratuitous deficits of the past eight years, our creditors, those who would extend the loans, would presumably, following the American model, Gary, of the 80s and 90s, say to us, you're going to have to cut your spending and we think you should be cutting it on defense. This is what people are waiting for. This is the question that is hinted at in the media these days, but I don't think is going to get picked up for another maybe year. At such time as when the U.S. actually needs another trillion in foreign borrowing, and then you see, you know, some kind of conditionality uh, attempted to be negotiated behind the scenes. This will be a very, you know, hidden, uh, below the radar, under the table kind of aspect of diplomacy in the next year or two, and it'll be fascinating to see how it plays out, conditionality on the United States.